on the backs of average everyday people. And it also gives more power really to capitalists over workers because it creates more competition for jobs and things like that, right? So that'll have a huge impact on the globe in addition to the war if the United States and Europe essentially engineer an economic recession and an economic crisis that I think will be worse than a recession, um, which will have huge ripple effects across the globe. And I, I think, so I think that speaks to that. So I, I'd like to say that uh, it'll be short and that there will be good positive resolutions to all these problems relatively soon. But I think given the relationship of forces, we could be headed into a sustained period of, of, of serious economic troubles, I think, all around the globe uh, in ways that could be you know, quite dangerous. Uh, you know, on the issue of the multipolar world, I, I mean, I guess, yeah, I'd like to think so. I mean, I'd like to think that that's the direction that the globe is moving in, but I think the real issue that is underlying all of it is what is the basis for global cooperation, friendship, and collaboration, um, and it's not really like capitalist trade and commerce, you know what I mean? I mean, I think that the, the, the biggest challenge we have from the point of view of why there's so many wars all around the world and so many attempts by big countries to dominate small countries and so on and so forth is that the, you know, this is the essence, uh, it was probably famously said by Clausewitz, right, that war is politics by other means. And so it's really the essence of how a handful of people want to try to enrich themselves around the globe that is driving all these different conflicts. So if a multipolar world is going to mean uh, something different, I think it's going to have to be on the basis of a deeper underpinning. Because right now, I think that there's a double-edged sword with that, right? I mean, there's a lot of leverage created, especially for small countries, to have the ability to trade with India, with China, with Russia, with the ASEAN countries, uh, and which is growing and continuing. It's opening up vast new possibilities and, and, and priorities. But the, so it's, it, it has that positive sense too, right? But there's another side to that coin that it also is increasing the level of competition between uh, certainly the West and everyone else because they fear the impact of this, right? The fact that, I mean, you look at so many of these countries in West Africa that have these huge imperialist military presences there. And you look at a lot of them, most of them, their number one trading partner already is China. So what is the essence of the military presence from the imperialists? Well, it's certainly not fighting terrorism or whatever excuse they've come up with. The essence of it is, is they're integrating that country's power structure with the imperialist military and saying, listen, we'll let you oppress your people as much as you want, and anyone who might oppose you or stand up to you won't be able to do so because we'll be giving you unlimited weapons, bombs, intelligence, or whatever, so that you can, you can stop them. And so it's a quid pro quo relationship because they recognize that without that, the economic underpinning of neocolonial is a little bit shaky. And so as that continues to accelerate as a conflict, I think it's very dangerous because it means that more and more sort of conflict points are going to break out as the West seeks to impose itself vis-a-vis -vis sanctions, vis-a-vis -vis invasions, vis-a-vis -vis military troop presences on any country that see or region that seeks to diverge from the status quo. So I think the real question is, is not is there going to be a multipolar world, and I'll close with this, um, but to speak exactly to your point about whether the, we can basically be living on a better world where people are trying to live sustainably amongst ourselves and amongst the planet, is do we have not a multipolar world, but a different type of pole, a social pole, where more and more countries and the people who live in them come to recognize that ev doing everything just to make a dollar, just to make profit, is not the way to live sustainably between each other and, and with the planet in and of itself. And we have to have a different understanding of centering people's needs, the right to education, to health care, to housing, to all the crucial things that human beings need to survive has to be at the center of the governing philosophy of all of the different infrastructures, however we set them up, if we want to move towards that kind of world. So I think if, if we can do that, which is a part of our struggle, then I think the answer is yes. Uh, I think if we can't, then, you know, we're also, again, headed in, in, into, I think, some, some dangerous territory where the world continues to, to bifurcate and to, to, to crack under the, the basis of this intense competition of the West to maintain its, its geopolitical peace. So there's, there's, a, there's an anti-imperialist element to the struggle, and then there's also a social and ideological element to the struggle that we also have to remember when we're talking about struggling against imperialism. It's not just about what you're against, it's also about what you're for in terms of what the outcome's going to be. I don't know what the question I'm is. I'm curious about multipolar. I also want to ask you. Please Eugene, go ahead. I'm sorry. Another great answer. Well, I just want to know, Eugene answered that masterfully, um, and I agree with everything he said. I just wanted to give a, a, a just one example of the sort of benefit of multipolarity, polarity, at least in the short term, though I absolutely agree with Eugene that without an ideology to back it up, what does multipolarity actually mean? It could actually lead to a more chaotic world. 
right? Unless we have some sort of ideology of how we forge a path towards like a future that makes sense, uh, underpinning it, like Eugene said, which of course I think most of us agree here is, is socialism. Um, but just, you know, very quickly, I think in the short term, there are so many benefits for developing countries, especially those that are being sanctioned. I want to give an example. Maybe benefits a strong term, but Syria is under these extreme sanctions. It's the most extreme sanctions, I think, in history. It's called the Caesar sanctions that the U.S. is enforcing on Syria, which make it like impossible even for, Syri for Syria's neighbors to do any trade with the country. Um, and so as a result of these sanctions that are so severe, Syria's entire electricity grid was basically built by the German company Siemens. And now Germany, the company, the German company, is refusing to honor any of its contracts because you constantly need to update and maintain electricity infrastructure, power stations, distributors, generators, or it collapses and it doesn't work anymore. And so Siemens, because of the sanctions and that they don't want to be uh, subjected to U.S. financial penalties, which are quite large for sanctions, so they're not honoring any of their contracts to maintain any of this equipment, you, the, you know, give them replacement parts. So as a result, slowly over the last couple of years, Syria's electricity infrastructure has been being replaced by China. China has come in, and not all of it, but eventually, at this rate, essentially all of Syria's electricity infrastructure will be Chinese. Um, but Chinese companies have come in, and they're starting to replace some of that equipment. And just having that alternative, even though maybe it doesn't work overnight, is essential to some of these countries being able to continue to survive. I mean, if it wasn't for Russia, China, and Iran, Syria would have zero electricity. At least they have like, I don't know, 10 hours a day. It's better than nothing. So I think that that's an important aspect of multipolarity. Uh, it definitely gives these countries leverage. And I think, you know, Eugene's given some African examples of that. But I, I want to just second what he said, that this is why it's so crucial for us to agree. What do we want the world to look like? You know, do we want this capitalistic world that, you know, is the underpinning of imperialism that has us living in this horrible, unequal system where like eight people own more average wealth than the bottom half of humanity combined? That's an atrocious figure. It should be scandalous. Um, so we have to have those conversations about what kind of world do we want to live in. And, you know, I think countries like Eritrea do provide an example of, the sort, of a sort of model that people can look to as, okay, this works. Okay, look at Cuba. This works. Okay, look, like, look, let's look at these countries and see what does work and what attributes do we want. And how can we all kind of collectively come together and push for that world? Otherwise, we're going to be in a really tough situation because... It's just going to be powerful countries vying for more power. It's going to lead to more conflict, more proxy wars, more hot war wars in a situation where a lot of these countries have nuclear arms. And, you know, the end result will not be very pretty if it gets to that. So, Okay. Yeah. In 2015, the U.S. was trying to, uh, one way or another, overthrow the government of Burundi. And this was in part because they had charted an independent path, and uh, they're at the they're at the uh, eastern end in Africa of the China One Belt One Road Initiative. Another reason was that they had negotiated a contract to mine their nickel reserves, and by the way, cobalt any mine has other minerals that are a byproduct of mining the main mineral they're going after. Uh, one of those is cobalt, and I'm sure everyone knows how important cobalt is to the new energy technologies. It's also absolutely essential to building jet engines. Um, they had signed a contract with a Russian firm to mine their nickel. And if you study WikiLeaks about Burundi, you can see that for many years, for decades, somebody was trying to put together a Western consortium to go after this nickel. Didn't work. Burundi said that Russia had offered them a better price. Well, the U.S. was not able to uh, overturn the government of Burundi. They did sanction it heavily. heavily. Now, they've finally more or less given up. The sanctions have been lifted. Uh, the African Union refused to <laughs> invade Burundi. They 
specifically on, on behalf of the U.S. and NATO who asked it to do that. Um, and I think this illustrates one of the greatest benefits of multipolarity, that it gives resource-rich countries an opportunity to negotiate for a fair price. And I told the story the other day of um, Eritrea's gold mine, the Bisha gold mine, and how uh, a Canadian firm was going to do the mining, because Canada is, by, way, by the way, the um, mining superpower of the world. Uh, a Canadian firm was going to um, was going to to use its technology uh, to to mine um, to mine this gold mine in Eritrea, and the project was going to be financed by a German firm. The U.S. bullied that German firm into opting out, and then finally a Chinese firm, a Chinese finance firm, stepped in, and eventually the Chinese firm bought the Canadian interest in the mine. But it's a fair deal. There are a number of calculations involved in uh, the way that profits are div divided, but basically it's a 50-50 deal. And Eritrea is sitting on the Arabian Nubian shield, which is a hugely resource-rich um, mineral, mineral area. And so this ability to negotiate with various sides in a multipolar world. Uh, it, and Eritrea's commitment to uh, demanding a fair deal could mean a huge uh, increase in the, in the country's standard of living. All right, yeah, I think we're good for another question. Go ahead. Okay, great. Hi, y'all. My name is Yolian Ogbu. Um, the question that I had, and this kind of goes back to what y'all were talking about in the context of the ordinary American isn't necessarily the enemy of Eritrea, right? And that made me kind of think about how at the end of the day, the enemy of all working class people and of states like Eritrea are the ruling class, whether that's in America, whether that's in Nigeria or Ethiopia, for example. What I find so unique about the national liberation movement of Eritrea is that national consciousness was necessary, but in order to achieve national unity, you had to have class consciousness kind of embedded in that work, whether that was EPLF, you know, working to organize however many villages and committees of people and making sure that people from all backgrounds, all every single tribe was involved in the struggle. And so what I'm thinking about in terms of moving forward and organizing the diaspora and making sure that these conversations remain at the forefront of fighting against imperialism, how do we ensure that we continue to talk about the class interests of our enemies rather than chalking it up to, say, tribalism. That tends to be the primary conversation in Ethiopia, right? We don't see that national unity because we have the ruling elite from several different ethnic groups fighting against each other to continue to, you know, pit the working class Ethiopians against each other. We don't see that in Eritrea, and I feel like that needs to continue to be talked about, studied, and really investigated it into why. And that's why I think that um, I'd, I'd love to get y'all's take and in, in how y'all navigate that in the media. No, I really appreciate that question. I, I think it's a crucially important issue, and I, I think the you know, the point that you raise in putting it in the Ethiopian context, I think, is, is very important and very timely, I think, for us to also remember our history. Like, what, what was it really that drove the process of removing the TPLF from power, starting with the protest in 2014? I mean, the framework in which it's often presented to us 
and you know, there's obviously a truth and a reality to this, but that it was sort of like an ethnic revolt against the TPLF. But when you really look at the heart of what happened, I mean, you have these millions of Oromo people who initially come into the streets, uh, and they were raising a number of different issues, and certainly they were raising issues of national oppression. But you know, really at the core of the protest, and it was a very young subset of protest, was the issue of economic inequality, the lack of unemployment, and the nature of the TPLF's ethnic federal system in driving their inability, uh, you know, really to have any sort of economic mobility and, and to, you know, any sort of economic development or whatever it may be. I say all that to say that it, to, to, it was really sort of a class mobilization. It was a mobilization of the masses of people. And what's important about that and, and what I'm tying in here is this was also the essence of why then hundreds of thousands of Amhara people came out in solidarity with the protests that were happening. I mean, unfortunately, this has been blotted out of history, even though it was very clear at the time. But for many people, it shocked the world to see, you know, I think it was like 250,000 people who came out in that first Amhara protest come out throwing up the Romo symbol and saying that they were in solidarity with, you know, their brothers and sisters who were already out there struggling, and that they felt similarly that this TBLF system of ethnic federalism was in and of itself a deeply class oppressive system where they, you know, a handful of people and their little foundations effort and stuff like that uh, were hoarding all of the resources from all of the so-called development of Ethiopia and, you know, using that only to, you know, continue to enrich their own enterprises and their own capitalist owners while everyone else was going, uh, uh, you know, essentially hungry without jobs and so on and so forth, but doing it under the guise of this, this ethnic federalism, right, and trying to pit people against each other. So I raise all that just to say that I do think that is a very, I, I mean, I I agree with you in terms of that point, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the struggle in Ethiopia and the levels of success that have had, and also the biggest challenges and why it is, why is it that imperialism thinks it's so important to continue to reinforce this hatred between the people of, of Ethiopia? I mean, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not in behind closed doors, I can't speak about anything, you know, directly, but it seems interesting to me that the second the TPLF appears defeated, the OLA, which represented almost nothing a few months before, now all of a sudden has hundreds more fighters and all sorts of weapons and is going around massacring thousands of people um, all across Oromia and Amara. Well, that doesn't seem like a coincidence to me. Uh, the same thing with the TPLF in terms of how they look to divide people. Uh, I, I mean, you know, it, it has the name of ethnicity, but it's really using ethnicity in the service of that same, that same agenda. So maybe I'll just wrap up what I'm saying here and, and pass it to Simon with this point that I do think that there's a lot to be said and a lot to be learned from the Eritrean experience and that goes back, you know, going many years where these points were raised by the EPLF in, in the 1980s and, and even before in relationship to Ethiopia itself. But I think also in terms of our experiences in Eritrea and what Rania already spoke to, that it's very clear that a huge part of the social cohesion that exists in the country is because of the fact that there is a strong understanding that it's a people first, people's needs first oriented uh, structure there. It's very, very clear. I mean, you know, you look at it, we talk, we've talked, many people talk about this. I think I was talking to a brother earlier who has told me he was in uh, Eritrea twice. Anyone who's been anywhere else really in the world who goes to Asmara, the thing that immediately jumps out at you, at least to me, and I think a lot of other people, is that it's, it's, very, it's like 100% safe, which is, uh, yes, I think that deserves applause, absolutely. Um, especially when you compare it to, to other, you know, developing countries. Many places I love, you know, but it's, it's such a sad thing when you go to, I love Johannesburg, for instance, but it's unbelievable, you know, the level of, of violence. You can't have that level of social cohesion amongst people in an atmosphere where it's a winner-take-all, hyper-capitalist, profit-first, profit-centered model of development. It just doesn't happen because when it's dog-eat-dog, -dog, everyone out for themselves, every, you know, the almighty dollar rules everything, that ultimately drives predation, it, di it drives hatred, it drives division, it drives violence. And, and so, so I, I think, think that, that that's, that's an important, important aspect, aspect of understanding why things like this aren't random. But the elements of co social cohesion that exist are deliberate based on the, the, the reality of having a people first approach to how you build an economy. So maybe the ultimate question is, and from I think our point of view of media, which I think was kind of the thrust, it speaks to the need for political education. I mean, the only way to keep things like this at the forefront is to be able to tell this history, to tell this story, to give the facts and the figures, to make the contrast between, you know, this capitalist profit-centered world and the countries and the nations that are putting people first and analyzing how these are not accidental things. And if we want to see positive changes in the United States, if we want to see
see positive changes in any other country is because we're moving more in a people-centered direction, less in a profit-centered direction. And I think, as we've said here many times, I think as you made, uh, the point you made very well uh, from the mic, Yolian, is, is this is something that we can learn and see in Eritrea from the history and from the contemporary reality, and that I think has a lot to offer to a lot of people, not just in other African countries and developing nations, but quite frankly, right here in the United States, where, you know, I live in New York City, so-called richest city on earth, and everywhere you go, there are people eating out of the trash and living on the street. Um, so what does that say about the kind of moral, morals and mentality of a capitalist system that we have to think about and overcome and where we can learn from others, uh, even in very different contexts, about how we can improve things? So I know, Simon, you wanted to speak to that um, as well, so I'll pass it on to you. But thank you for the question. So I think uh, it's important to understand that um, nations are, are like it's a project, right? And it's, it's something, we, we have this concept of nation building and that you have to build a nation. It doesn't happen overnight. And nations through colonialism, we know were imposed on Africa. And the concept of a nation goes back to the Westphalia peace, uh, 1640s I believe it was, you know, and that created the, the modern nation state. And this is the structure of, this is the global system today. It's based on these nation states. And so whether we like it or not, these are the structures that, that we have to adapt to and, and work with. And so um, because they were imposed through colonialism, and you know, when we look at Africa, uh, every, you know, every one of them is a, is a colonial construct. Even the borders of Ethiopia, if you look, uh, those are all colonial borders. And so at the end of the day, um, you know, within these nations, uh, we're going to have to nation build, and when it comes to Ethiopia, you have multiple, you know, all these different tribes, all, all countries in Africa, you have different tribes, different ethnicities, different religions. Um, you can have all these sectarian issues, and you have to find a way to make it all work, and it's a process. And so uh, I believe in the brotherhood of humanity, and we have to constantly keep working to build these higher order systems to get to, you know, one one people on earth. And so in that process, you know, it doesn't make sense that we're going in the other direction and breaking down towards, you know, the tribe, the clan, the family, and down to the individual person and saying, me, 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 me. So we have to be able to build upwards and it's, it's gonna take time. And so when we look at a country like Ethiopia, who are those who are pushing the sectarianism? You know, who are pushing, in Eritrea, same thing. We have, we had that, te we had that tendency during our struggle and we had to stamp it out. We had to use organization, ideology, vision, all that stuff to, 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 you know, to stamp that out of Eritrean society. And so it's not like Eritrea was ready, like built and ready to go. It was a process and it took time. And so people have to see that. And people like to look at this slice of time and say, oh, it doesn't work. That, oh yeah, it's impossible. It, it, we don't have a choice. We have to fight, it is a struggle. If you don't see it through the eyes of struggle, then you know, you're gonna fail right away. So I think people have to struggle to build their nations and we have to fight the tendency towards sectarianism and you have to have a vision, you have to have an ideology. Without an ideology, it's not gonna work. And so I believe in Eritrea, we were so lucky and so fortunate to have a principled leadership that had a very clear vision and, 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 and way of looking at the world and connecting with the progressive movements of the world that were open-minded to accept whatever type of peoples and whatever type of nations, whatever type of tribes, whatever type of whatever. So um, that is the kind of, these are the type of people that, that, that think like this that we're going to need in every one of these countries, Ethiopia, Eritrea, all throughout Africa, all throughout the, the world. Um, and so the, the days of the past and moving that other way, and, and <clears throat> I shouldn't say the past, you're actually seeing a more, a world that's moving increasingly left and right and the center is kind of, you know, dissipating. And so, um, uh, and so that, that rightward tendency towards like your tribe or your, your, you know, your race or whatever, it's something that we have to fight. We have to be united. We have to create a uni united front against this thing. And one of the things about the, I guess we haven't really talked about it with the No More Movement, um, is like we, we are focusing on that and breaking down those, those barriers between peoples and specifically and explicitly creating a united front against these tribalist, sectarianist, uh, sectarian type of tendencies and so um, we have to continue to struggle we have to fight and um, it's not we don't have a choice it's either that or we perish I want to add something to that um, 
I just want to. I just want to add. I'm. I. I there's, this is an ongoing struggle uh, for obviously not just Africa, for all parts of the developing world. Part, you know, partly because what both of you alluded to, right, is that imperialism tries to take advantage of these divisions that already exist. And it comes in, the US and Europe, they come in, they try to, you know, they'll give money, or most importantly, they'll fund NGOs that explicitly try to divide even more. And so one thing I just wanted to note about Eritrea that I loved is that they've kicked out those US NGOs. There are no more US NGOs, and they are so destabilizing. All across the Middle East, they still exist, and they're so destabilizing, and they really do try to intensify those divisions. So having an ideology is so important, and it is an ongoing struggle, because the US is always trying to find any way to go any division, any division that exists, to try to utilize it to their advantage, to get people at each other's throats, and to have that mentality of moving backwards rather than forward. So it's something you constantly have to think about, and Eritrea is constantly thinking about it. And you know, again, another one of those kinds of like examples for others to look to, I think, uh, going forward. But anyways, other question? So we do have one question before we wrap up. Um, Sassen wanted to, uh, Sassen, sorry, wanted to, um, have the opportunity to ask you one last question. I guess my question is a good concluding question. Um, so I think it's great that you guys provided like a conceptual analysis and kind of the intersections or ways we can relate to other groups of people to kind of leverage those, um, the human connection in order to kind of achieve our goals. But just as important as understanding the concepts that you guys were explaining and the analyses um, is actionable items that each of us can take in this room to leverage the human capital that we have here. So if you, each of you come say one effective, actionable item that each of us can take once we step out of this room in order to achieve this vision that you're talking about and that a lot of us subscribe and opt into, I think that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, one actionable item. I would say, because mm, there's so many. Uh, yeah, it's hard. It's not easy. Uh, I would say join a party, join a, a, a revolutionary party uh, in the United States, and, or when it comes to Africa, um, a party with vision. Uh, I look at PFDJ and what everything that it's doing, and um, I think it's very important to, um, you know, have have a vision. Like we have a national charter in Eritrea, the 1994 charter. We're headed in one direction, you know, and it's very clear. It's a struggle, so you know, it's you know, kind of ups and downs. But we have we have a vision, and we're headed in that direction. And so I think it's important to join uh, a party. So uh, that's one thing. I could say more, but uh, <laughs> only one. All right. you're only allowed. You're only allowed one. No, there are so many things we can all do, but since we were told only one, um, this is going to sound like shameless self-promotion, but it's not, and I'll explain why. But one thing you can do is you can support independent anti-imperialist media, and you have two outlets up here on stage right now that you can support. You have Breakthrough News, which me and Eugene work for. You can go to breakthroughnews.org and you can donate to Breakthrough News, you can become a patron of Breakthrough News at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. And, you know, it sounds like self-promotion, but, you know, the work we do to try to inform people about these issues is important so we can go to Eritrea, so we can go to Ethiopia and do that on the ground reporting so we can produce, uh, you know, high quality interviews to help inform people so we can do produce our podcasts and our journalism, our investigative pieces, all of this is crucial in building that consciousness that we need so people you know, can become anti-imperialists in the first place. You can support Black Agenda Report where Anne works and she can maybe tell you where to go to do that. But again, independent media, this sort of media arm of the movement, if you will, which is what Breakthrough News' tagline is, is absolutely crucial uh, to, to pushing these kinds of movements forward. So that's one, one item. 
Oh, Ron, you sort of stole my fire there. That's what I was going to say too. And you can, you can uh, support Black Agenda Report at blackagendareport.com. There's the donate button. Uh, I think I would also recommend, as I said before, visiting the Sanctions Kill website, sanctionskill.org. Uh, we're open to participation of anyone else who's sincerely interested. Uh, of course, opposing 6600, 6, HR 6600 and 3199 are absolutely crucial for Eritrea and Ethiopia. And I'm resolving to just become repetitive about that. Whenever anyone asks me about Ethiopia and Eritrea, I am going to speak to 6600 and 3199. Uh, but as an action, you can become more broadly involved in the anti-sanctions movement and sanctionskill.org is a good place to start. a lot of resources about a lot of this information, but the key fact is to get it in the hands of people uh, who don't already have it and so that they can use it uh, to, to push the struggle forward. So my one thing would be have five conversations in the next two weeks with someone who you haven't talked to about these issues before and share some of the resources that are up here in relationship to sanctions, in relationship to the struggle, in relationship to just information about countries like Eritrea and what's really going on there. Perhaps share your own experiences. But basically, we have to take the, the, the old and it goes back to slavery here in the United States, slogan of each one teach one, and we have to really be all about that. And all of us have much broader social networks than we ever think we are. So a lot of times we talk to our friends who we consider to be quote unquote political friends and family members, and that's about it. So that would be my, my one thing, and, and in a way a challenge to people. Looking at all these resources, everything you've heard here, the reasons that brought you to this event here today, have five conversations with five people you've never talked to this about before, share some of these resources, share why it was important for you to be at an event like this with them, and in the conversation with the challenge for, hey, what can we do together to actually change this state of affairs? Because if we don't continue to view each of ourselves as an ambassador and a diplomat and an organizer that can, can change things, we're going to fail. It can't be hoping someone else does it. It has to be us. So next two weeks, have five conversations, and I think you'll see more come out of that than you might, you might expect. And thank you so much. So thank you, thank you very much. I'm sorry, was there an answer? Someone wanted to add it? No. Okay, cool. So just to do uh, the math, for all of us who know Dr. Uh, Gideon, if he was here, he would have told us what that speaking to the next five people would mean, right? So if, we're, if there's 500 people here, um, Tonight we'll have a thousand people, right? So if we speak, one person speaks to five people, that's 2,500, and another five, so those people speak to another five, is 12,500. And so that's how we grow the number. So that's a very good point. Um, thank you very much. Let's give a, a hand to our great panelists. So just uh, for your information, this has been recorded. It's a great resource. Uh, you'll find it on Airy Express. It's also been going uh, live. Uh, but please share this information with everyone as well. So thank you very much. Uh, we are going to go for a lunch break. I think, yep, lunch is served. And um, let's meet back here. I'm sorry, is this really loud or is it me? Okay. Um, let's meet back here at 4.30, right? 4.30, half hour lunch break and come back for our next segment. Thank you.
Yeah, go ahead, clap. Adeta tsile zebulna elelta yellen malatu. Abotasna elela yebulundiom. I don't know. So, um, you know, we've we've heard uh, a lot from their perspectives regarding um, colonialism and imperialism, and today they are going to focus on the struggle or the fight against um, fed, uh, social uh, against. Uh, colonialism and against uh, imperialism. So I am going to ask that they, for anyone here who may not have heard of you guys, possible, but just in case, we might have one or two. If you could please tell us about yourselves before you um, go on into your speech, that would be great. Uh, once they uh, tell us, uh, do their presentation, the panel will uh, do self-discussion, we'll do a self-led discussion, and then uh, from there we will have question and answer period. So without further ado, to our great panelists, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sole. Uh, <clears throat> hey everyone, I'm Simon Tispamariam. I am the executive director of the New Africa Institute, and I have a background in uh, medicine, and sort of took a very different turn uh, directly, actually during medical school and afterwards, um, you know, in this fight against imperialism. Really, the fight goes further back through the years, and uh, in particular in college, you're learning to organize within the Eritrean community and connecting with a lot of different progressive groups, being active in organizing the community in Seattle. Um, and then moving on to, you know, the national level and then connecting back home, going back home, uh, doing my service there, civil service and, um, you know, really w being back there, working back there, you are, by just doing that, fighting imperialism, in my opinion, because um, the entire country is in this fight to develop itself, to, um, you know, to, to be the master of its own destiny. The, the people are fighting for their power and to shift the equation in back to what you find. You know, partly because what both of you alluded to, right? Uh, the uh, demanding a fair deal could mean a huge... Just doing that, fighting imperialism, in my opinion, because um, the entire country is in this fight to develop itself, to, um, you know, to, to be the master of its own destiny. The, the people are fighting for their, you know, uh, social justice and fighting the good fight in the world, in a, in, in a, in a world where there are certain nations that do not want uh, these developing nations to, uh, you know, to come up and have a sovereign path, fight for their people, for, for you know, eliminating poverty from their society and um, you know, fighting for social justice and all these good things. And so by going back home and participating in that, I learned so much and um, it, it, you know, made me the person who I am, continues to develop me and all these things. And so um, I <coughs> then brought a lot of that work back here into the States after living there for roughly two and a half years. And that experience has helped me to figure out how to bridge the divide between the diaspora and the folks back home. And we're all collectively fighting this fight together. And so I've had a wonderful um, chance to connect with so many amazing people. Uh, in particular, you're seeing them to my right here. And uh, over this past year with the struggle, year and a half, this, uh, this struggle in the Horn of Africa that has united the Horn of Africa, the, this, this, this TPLF war essentially against the Horn, um, and it is a proxy force for the United States, which is an imperialist force, unfortunately, in this world. And, um, and so, so yeah, so I, I, I've... <laughs> I'm a 
ترا ما دست دستی آمد آمد آن می تز بیتی قبل پیدایی شراور دمایی متعرضی بزرگ آقمی ناز ناز کوی نو که لود دامان لام بر دمی خو تازه سپرنم و من یاد نمی سخاس سخی کاری که خدشی کم نیت مالی حد زد حد کی نای حسبی کبری دارو و علنا نت بک مخری و شمت نت سنتی آب زبان جدی پرونی علنا و نیت مالی وعلى تعم مغري من النتزق هدت ناي حزبنا كبري دسيات ناي نازنت شعو عن قدلي أنا كوزير مدت الله مغمت مالي استیبال ایت را فلی حلقت نای رای مبزور هندسی تلمی اب آورد بالی مسافر لونا و نایت مالی هاتی زکاتی نای خس به کبری دار و آدنا نصب مخی Watch my nuts in the wood I'm seven deadly For all your dada Come night money Tell me to do me No matter how so wrong Come sell hard in the wood Let's start the return My time is just for Shour is honey Sing in the car seat Yeah, I'm good honey سبح من قدي نص غزل غني خلال عرم بادي تحل خوتي قيرت ما هو بالي هو يا خدت هو ما خمت معني
Come on, baby. 